Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Sir Optimist International Esperance, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to All Things Menopause. Today, the 18th of October, is World Menopause Day. It's an important event which serves to raise awareness and educate people about the menopause. Menopause is a completely natural stage of life, yet it is still a taboo subject with many women feeling ashamed to discuss their symptoms, seek medical help or ask for extra support in the workplace or at home. The theme for World Menopause Day 2024 is menopause hormone therapy, which I'm sure we will be hearing a bit about later. I am thrilled to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Sally Ann Ishmael, obstetrician gynecologist. Dr. Ishmael holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry and Analytical Chemistry and Biochemistry. She attained her medical degree MBBS at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine. Subsequently, she did her postgraduate training in the UK in obstetrics and gynecology. Luckily for us, she has been back some 17 years and has worked in public and private practice. She left Port of Spain General Hospital in 2022, where she was the acting head of department of, of obstetrics and gynecology for six years. She is now solely in private practice at her clinic in St. James. Dr. Ishmael, I would like to extend a very warm welcome from all of us here. It is such a privilege to have you. Well, thank you very much, Charmaine. It's a pleasure to be here too. Um, and it was a very warm introduction. Thanks again. Um, okay, so I think we'll just get started. Um, as you can see from the first slide, all things menopause is a very expansive topic and it will be very hard to to get anywhere deeper than the surface in just 30 minutes, but we're gonna try, okay? So first off, let's start with the definition. Well, let's start with the objectives. So what's the point of all of this? Well, you know, ultimately, as you can see there on the screen, the idea is to help better define the transition that is universal to all of us maturing women, something that we can't escape, something that we can't get away from. And to realize that because it is so diverse in its presentation, that care should not be should not be generalized, but it should be something that is very individual. And that means that you can't talk to your friend and say, well, you're doing this, so let me do that too now, right? Because it may not apply to you. And you know us Chinese love to do that kind of thing, right? Um, if I'll break down into the colloquialism here. Um, the other reason, the other things that we want to do, the other aims of this talk is to understand the options that we have available so that we can better manage our symptoms ourselves. Truthfully, we don't have a lot of options, hormone replacement options in Trinidad. That's one of the biggest deficiencies that we meet right now, um, not just right now, but for a long time. And I know that there are powers that be that are working on trying to change that. And of course, you know, not just managing the symptoms ourselves, but recognizing when we need to seek help. Yes. And then to know how and when or even if to stop the treatment. What is menopause? Well, basically, it's when you stop seeing your periods. It's the last menstrual period. It's when your ovaries stop producing hormones and no longer release eggs. Now, strictly speaking, the ovaries can still continue to produce hormones. So the, the, the most important line there is that it no longer releases eggs. Yes. It is a retrospective diagnosis. I mean, nobody can actually say this is going to be my last period. You have to go through the last period and then reflect upon it and say, hey, you know, August was my last period. I haven't seen it yet for, you know, last three months, last four months. And even then, you can't say truthfully that you are actually past the menopausal period. You have to have 12 consecutive months where there is no bleeding, right, after the last period. And no bleeding means no bleeding. So we're not talking about a period that you consider a normal period. We're talking about if you wipe and you see pink, you have to start all over again. So you go from having 11 months and 27 days, you start, you wipe, you see a little bit of spotting, then it goes back to zero. And you have to start the 12 month count from then again, right? So it's, it's, it's that specific. 
the usual age is between the usual age of onset of, of menopause or the actual menopause is between 45 and 55. It averages to be about 47 and a half years. It's most commonly occurring at around 50 to 53. There is ethnic variation. So believe it or not, Latinas tend to have an earlier onset by as much as two years in some cases. And of course, it's affected by your individual health status as well. If it happens before the age of 40, it is called premature menopause, and that definitely should be investigated, okay? That time after menstruation ceases marks the beginning of the postmenopausal post phase. So technically, in retrospect, when you know that your last period was 13 months ago, you can say that you are now postmenopausal, and you have been for the last 12 months, 13 months. Okay, so in other words, it too is a retrospective diagnosis. I hope that's clear. I know it could get a little bit confusing sometimes. So, and what is the perimenopause then? Well, the perimenopause is that transition. It's that transition that occurs from the moment the symptoms start, from the moment your periods become irregular, from the moment your ovaries say, okay, well, I'm starting to fail now, right? And it's right up until the last menstrual period. Right, so again, it could be anywhere from a few months to up to five years, sometimes even more in some patients. So you could start having symptoms as early as 47 and still not see your last period until you're 53. Okay, that's not uncommon. And of course, during that time is when your periods become terribly infrequent for most of us right they vary in volume and duration so in that is during that time that you get led to your to your gp or your gynecologist for for reassurance i thought this was kind of cute so just to kind of break the distraction <laughs> okay so the menopause now like i said it's very expansive yes so you have more than 35 symptoms that you could attribute to the menopause some of us may have very little of these symptoms and if we're very lucky we don't actually recognize i wouldn't say we won't, we don't get any but we don't recognize that we have symptoms and it usually from a treatment plan perspective it's easy it's easier to kind of break these symptoms up into what we call acute symptoms medium term symptoms and then the symptoms associated with the long term health implications Right. So the acute symptoms are what everybody kind of regurgitates on TV. It was it's what most people talk about these days. It's the it's the vasomotor symptoms. It's the hot flashes. It's the night sweats, and the hot flashes and the night sweats, which can actually be day sweats as well. Right. What that actually does is that that would lead to a certain degree of insomnia. You you get night sweats. You can't sleep. You feel very, you know, uneasy. And then what happens? You become very irritable. And that irritability, you know, can propagate and then you could end up going down a rabbit hole to the point where you actually start developing things like depression or let's, let's just say low mood, right? It could interfere with interpersonal relationships. So it has a way of cascading. And these symptoms are not, although we're dividing it into three, it should not be something that we, that we think of in isolation. They all kind of overlap, right? And the same way that the hot flashes and night sweats could lead to the to the irritability and the, the impact on the psychological symptoms, right? And psychological symptoms would basically include things like your mood swings, your anxiety, the palpitations, right? The panic attacks, right? Um, low mood is more common than, than depression, but depression is not impossible. And my favorite, the poor memory, and the, something that we call word aphasia, you know, when you you have that object in your head that you're thinking of and you just look at somebody and you go that thingy now that thingy and you can't think of that word to actually say i want the pen give me the pen pass the pen but pen the word pen does not come to your mind <laughs> that is what we call word aphasia believe it or not that is something that is very typical of menopause and then of course the physical symptoms like body odor headaches thinning hair, brittle nails, fatigue, 
breast pain, abdominal bloating, weight gain, all of these things are very common with menopause. The long-term health implications, well, as it says there, you know, especially if you have children in your reproductive age group, you might find that pelvic floor dysfunction becomes a real possibility, especially if those pregnancies end up being very long labors and very big children, then you could end up having urinary issues, right? So leakage is common. Your womb prolapsing or herniating is another issue. Of course, having issues with your bowel as a result is also a possibility. Cardiovascular disease, well, yes. Um, cardiovascular disease as we get older too is it's more common. It's more common in men as they get older, but they have more cardiovascular events just before in their late 40s, 50s than we do. And that's because of our protective effect of the estrogen. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. It's the same reason that protective estrogenic effects is the same reason why when we lose it at menopause, we end up being becoming very prone to things like brittle bones or osteoporosis. And then of course, there's that cancer story, right? Um, as we get older, breast cancer, womb cancer, ovarian cancer are, are always more common. This is an example of, well, a listing in, of, of the symptoms um, as we categorize them. You all can take a look at it. You see how it's very, very expansive, right? These are examples of diaries. I'm a big fan of the menopause diary. It is how I was trained when I was in the UK to assess women. Um, and I think it's a very useful tool for you, the individual, to be able to actually see for yourself, not just what affects you the most, whether it's the acute symptoms, whether it's the medium term symptoms, or whether it's a combination of all of them together to see how severe those symptoms are and how they impact on you. And then when you implement treatments and you repeat the diary, you can see for yourself without me having to tell you, you have that objective and subjective approach to improvement or in, in some cases, lack of improvement, right? So the first thing that you have to do, obviously, if you have doubts about whether you're menopausal or if you just want to make sure yourself is obviously go see your doctor, right? And as we mentioned before, the symptom diaries to me are a big, a big part of, of being able to implement treatment in the right way. In that whole process, of course, as per any doctor's investigation, you know, she should be asking you um, questions related to your symptoms to make sure that, you know, she identifies any other potential possibilities for the cause of those symptoms, because there's a lot of overlap. Um, she has to make sure that you are not on any, con any form of contraception, because contraceptives can impact, sometimes in a positive way, sometimes in a negative way on those symptoms. And she has to examine the potential possibility for, for reasons not for you not to have treatment. Um, hormone replacement therapy is big on that list, but even simple other things like um, even herbal products, right? Um, there are a lot of drug interactions with a lot of the over-the-counter um, herbal products that we use. And because those, those herbal products are not regulated Right, it is very tricky to actually just go and decide that you're using it without conferring with your doctor first. Yes, because there are a lot of drug interactions with those things. And then, of course, she should be using the opportunity to discuss anything that you can do to prevent things from happening to you that are related to the menopause, specifically those long term complications that we were talking about the heart disease, the stroke, the osteoporosis right? And even the cancers. Okay. Um, she'll also obviously talk to you about all the lifestyle changes that you could make, like dietary measures and, the, and exercise, vitamin supplementation, etc. So investigations, I know that there are a lot of people out there that rely on blood tests, but you do not need a blood test. If you are a typical patient in the 45 to 55 year um, age group, and your periods have gone all wonky on you, and you have any of those or all of those symptoms, those three, five symptoms that we listed previously, you know, then you're pretty much in menopause. That's all you need, right? That's really all you need. 
that in a and a consultation with a with a good doctor right um, to rule out any other potential but rare situations right um, or any other comorbidities right uh, before implementing any treatment that's what you need right um, you don't need an investigation you don't need blood tests the exception to that is if it is that you're in premature menopause so if it is that you we suspect that you are menopausal because you have missed your period or your periods are going all wonky on you before the age of 40 and you have a lot of those symptoms that suggest menopause then and only then well not only then but then primarily is when we would do um the hormone tests that you see there labeled as fsh that fsh stands for follicular stimulating hormone okay anybody who's on any kind of hormonal therapy contraceptives probably um, should not have blood tests done um, because they will obviously skew any results that you have okay additional tests may be warranted if your clinical history suggests particular risk factors so if when you go to the doctor before starting hormone replacement therapy she needs to rule out any other potential issues then things like colonoscopies endometrial biopsies and other blood tests can be performed, can be requested, right? Especially if it is that she thinks that you may be at high risk of forming clots, then blood tests and potential referrals may be necessary. And of course, in these consultations, you want to be able to make sure that you are up to date with your routine screening, right? So mammograms in particular, breast ultrasound scans, sometimes a combination of both of them, and of course, your cervical smears. Right, treatment options. Well, like we talked about before, care should be individualized, right? In otherwise healthy women, hormone replacement therapy is the first line treatment for relief of those vasomotor symptoms, the hot flashes, the night sweats, the day sweats, right? And potentially mood swings, etc. right? Um, psychological symptoms too, it improves low mood and it helps with the sleep disturbances. The sleep disturbances, again, mostly because it is multifactorial. As we mentioned before, with the night sweats potentially causing insomnia. Um, it also has been shown to improve genital urinary symptoms. Um, the term genital urinary symptoms of menopause, we will talk about a little bit later on, as we would with the musculoskeletal syndrome of menopause. And it is indicated too for the prevention of fracture and possibly for cardiovascular disease, right? And we will talk a little bit more about that as well. Other pharmacological alternatives would be as listed there. You have lubricants, moisturizers, that big long word dehydroepiandrosterone. That is basically a hormone produced by our bodies that gets converted into a lovely hormone that plumps up the vagina, um, strengthens bone, gives us a lot of energy. But long-term use with that is controversial. Okay, alpha-2 agonists are basically blood pressure uh, medications. Um, the one that is particularly cited for use in menopausal patients and specifically for vasomotor symptoms is not generally readily available here in Trinidad. Selective serotonin receptor uptake inhibitors and selective noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. I'm sorry for the big long medical terms, but there's no simpler way to put that. But those are basically... Uh, medications that are used for antidepressant for, for depression right um, but they have found use in treatment of various forms and symptoms of um, menopause and we'll talk about them a little bit later of course against the background of the hormone replacement therapy and all of those other pharmacological um, options uh, this this is again what you need I think all of us in large part need to focus on those lifestyle measures to improve general health and well-being right so stress management weight control having a healthy diet exercising routinely um, those are all very important aspects avoiding or stopping caffeine and alcohol consumption smoking is something that you know we should stop especially around the menopausal period they do not help um, diet and supplements, again, that ties in with the lifestyle measures, and we'll talk a little bit more about these when we get the chance, when we're summarizing at the, at the end. 
the botanicals well phytoestrogens that's um that's our lovely wonderful herbs so things like red clover and soy black cohosh is very popular evening primrose oil does nothing people nothing it's all placebo effects i'm throwing that in there and i'm sure i'll have people questioning me afterwards but there you go um ginseng st john's wort chest berry chinese hips all of these things they have they have their uses, I guess. Um, I won't discredit all of them, but we just have to be very careful about using them willy-nilly. And you should always seek advice before initiating it, um, despite the fact that it's readily available, some of them anyway. Acupuncture, acupressure, and cooling bracelets. Now, yes, these are relatively harmless. Um, and they have been shown to produce some impact. Cooling bracelets are actually relatively new. Uh, there's one brand name called Ember Wave that has gotten um, particularly okay satisfactory reviews um, online. And um, what it does is basically it looks like a watch that you wear with the face of the watch on the inner aspect of your wrist. And when you press the button during a during a hot flash, it stimulates the nerves and sends signals to your brain to actually make it recalibrate and rapidly reduce your body temperature. And it could do that apparently by as much as five degrees Celsius. So they have some positive reviews online there. Um, hypnotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, those are particularly useful in patients in whom hormone replacement therapy are not um, are not something that they can that they can have. Reflexology, magnetism, homeopathy, these are all things that don't have any definitive evidence that they work, but there's no real harm per se in trying it. Stellate ganglion blockade, well, we, we might talk about that a little bit later on. That is a somewhat drastic measure where we actually block the nerves at the base of the neck um, when we have very severe symptoms of of hot flashes and night sweats um, and everything else has failed, right? So this is a little kind of summary where you see dietary sources of hormones, right? So there's nothing that says that you can't literally just modify your diet to include more of these things and you may actually find it's not going to work with, with, um, with very severe symptoms, not by itself, but it can definitely supplement. The testosterone boosting foods are interesting. We'll talk about testosterone too. Um, again, please, going back to the investigations aspect, note that especially in the perimenopausal period, nobody should be really doing blood tests on you to assess your testosterone level. It's not a single testosterone level. Um, testosterone blood levels in women fluctuate during the day as well as during your cycle. The best time to do any kind of blood test, testosterone-wise, would be during the hours of seven and 10. And even if you got a, a low or a low normal result during that time, you can't make the diagnosis of having low testosterone. You'll have to repeat the test again. Um, so you have to have at least two consecutive tests, but it might just be better to adjust your food, your diet, and see if it makes any kind of improvement before spending money on a blood test. Yes? So botanicals, well, these are the herbs. So the isoflavones that you see there, those are the soy products and the red clover, etc. cetera, that um, is quite popular. And you can see that the reason why they, they produce, uh, they're therapeutic, they can produce relief with vaso, with, with the hot flashes and night sweats in particular and with other menopausal symptoms is because it has estrogenic actions. But the negative aspect of it is those same estrogenic actions affect breast and womb tissue, right? Blue, black cohosh um, has similar hormonal effects. Um, it also has a serotonin effect. Serotonin is another hormone that is particularly important in muscle strength, memory, mood, um, but it's 
has implications again with breast tissue and it can actually be problematic on your liver. So if you have a, a issue with your liver or if you have any other kind of liver disease or the potential of any other kind of liver disease, you have to be careful about using black cohosh. Donkwai is has not been shown to be effective for the treatment of hot flashes and night sweats. It doesn't have much implication for any of the other menopausal symptoms either. And it has these substances called coumarins that make you bleed. So again, you have to be very careful about it. When you have a bleeding disorder um, and you use that, you're making it worse. Um, during the menopause, when you could get fluctuations in the volume and frequency and duration of your period, um, in a lot of circumstances, you know, it, it becomes heavier and you use this hoping that it will help, it may actually worsen the condition. And as you can see there, evening primrose oil has not been shown in any kind of trials to be particularly effective for not just the vasomotor symptoms, but for a lot of other things and to the point where it has pretty much been withdrawn. Kava is another herbal product that used to be particularly um, popular back in the day but and and it's been particularly um it's been used in particular with anxiety and it has been shown to alleviate some anxiety symptoms but that big thing about the hepatotoxicity that liver issue and it has been pulled from the uk um for that reason because the impact on liver is quite significant Ginkgo biloba, you can see same thing, it causes you, it causes clots. So again, if you're prone to clot formation, it's not the best choice. And St. John's wort, well, that has a lot of interactions with a lot of drugs, um, immunosuppressants in particular. So it's not something that you're gonna necessarily recommend for quite a lot of people. You have to be very careful with that. We'll talk about that a little bit more as well. So we into HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Well, okay, so women with a uterus need estrogen and progestogen. Women without the uterus may be prescribed estrogen alone unless there is a history of endometriosis. Endometriosis is an estrogen-dependent um, condition, so you need to be able to give it the progestogen to balance it off. So you need to have progestogen um, despite having removed your womb if you had a history of endometriosis. Hormone replacement therapy is available as tablets, patches, gels, implants, and injections with at least four different dosing combinations. And um, helping women choose an appropriate formulation, one that suits her individual requirements and needs, can take time. So this is a summary of those four dosing regimes. And you can see that um, essentially, if we keep in mind, I know this is kind of very medical, so I'm gonna try and break it down as, as simply as possible. If you have a womb, then you need estrogen and progestogen. Uh, if you are in the perimenopausal phase, then we encourage you to still have a monthly bleed. So sequential combined cyclical hormone replacement therapy is what you'd need. Um, if it is that you are kind of more leaning towards the postmenopausal aspect, so you might have had 10 months of having no period or you're spotting very lightly, so and your symptoms are quite profuse, and you're really not keen on, on having a, a proper bleed every month anymore, then you can have a, a period with a sequential long cycle HRT. You can have a period, a light period, every three months. Continuous combined hormone replacement therapy is something that we give to postmenopausal patients. Um, you don't have a bleed with that at all. That is the only form of oral preparation that we have in Trinidad in the form of Angelique. So Angelique, which you'll see in Superfarm and Starlight Drugs and all of the other big pharmacies, Pennywise, um, the only one that is um, available through C40, through the distributors, that is a continuous combined hormone replacement therapy and therefore should only be given to you if you are postmenopausal. Um, the other alternative, of course, is something that, again, you don't see you don't see any bleed again. You get a, a substance, a, a drug that is basically estrogenic, androgenic, and progestational. 
right? So you don't have any withdrawal bleed. And it doesn't have the same kind of impact on your breast tissue and your womb tissue that, um, that the estrogen would have. And this again is a little um, chart that we used to use back in the day, right? So you could see again, decision to start HRT. So it just kind of summarizes basically what we were talking about there. You'll see at the bottom, treatment is indicated for two to three years if the main aim is to control the hot flashes and night sweats. But if you need something a little bit more, right, then you may need longer, longer duration of treatment. You might need at least five years if you're going to try, if you're using it to protect your heart or to prevent fractures. Risk and benefits of um, HRT, well, blood clots in your legs and lungs, breast cancer, those are the two big risks. Cardiovascular disease, heart disease and stroke, well, um, there was a big study done some many years ago, uh, 22 years ago, um, that misled us to think that the HRT actually worsened heart disease. The reevaluation of that study data actually proved that we were right in our hypothesis all along that the estrogen is protective, but it's all about when you start it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Osteoporosis, well, yes, one of the strong positives about hormone replacement therapy in the long run is the fact that it, it does prevent brittle bone disease um, and a lot of the symptoms surrounding um, brittle bone disease or the lead up to brittle bone disease. And again, we will talk about that um, again at the end. So blood clots. So short vision, hormone replacement therapy in tablet form, not the patches, not the gels, not the creams, are linked to a higher risk of developing a blood clot. If you are at a high risk of developing a blood clot, so for example, you're overweight, you have a family history, then you want to consider HRT, then you should be offered patches and gels or creams at the standard doses before you're offered tablets. Now, it's not that patches and gels aren't available or even the creams not available in Trinidad. They're just not readily available because they come in by what we refer to as suitcase trade. So access is not always uniform. If you have a significant family history or there are other reasons for your higher risk status, then it may be best for you to be referred to a hematologist, a doctor who specializes in blood conditions before you start HRT. Breast cancer risk? Well, the risk of breast cancer in women over the age of 50 is a complex issue. But studies show that estrogen only hormone replacement therapy causes little or no change in the risk of breast cancer. This is from the same study 22 years ago that misdirected us with respect to the cardiac disease. Um, again, the analysis broke it down very nicely and um, simplified the risk to basically what you see there. The HRT that contains estrogen and progestin may increase the risk of breast cancer and that risk also increases the longer you use it for. The risk is small and falls again when you discontinue the HRT. Now, and if you are or if you are or if you are at high risk of having breast cancer, if you had breast cancer, then it's probably best just to avoid it. Now, I want to say something to um, HRT does not cause breast cancer. It might promote and I say might promote your risk of breast cancer. So if you have a tendency, whether that tendency is genetic or environmental, to developing the HR to, to developing the breast cancer, then the HRT might help get you there faster. That that rate at which you get there is obviously going to be, uh, or the risk of you getting there is going to be um, higher the longer you use it for. That's basically what they're saying. But keep in mind that when you are on HRT because we know that there is an increased risk of breast cancer, slight though it may be, we encourage you to be monitored. So you who are on HRT will be worrying about the breast cancer more, having your mammograms and breast ultrasound scans more often, 
and therefore you are more likely to actually detect any cancer than someone who is not on hormone replacement therapy and therefore have some something done about the breast cancer or the potential for the breast cancer before the other person. So the increased risk of breast cancer does not translate to an increased risk of death from breast cancer. Okay? Heart disease and stroke, that's cardiovascular disease. So in women less than 60, Hormone replacement therapy that contains estrogen and progestogen does not increase the risk of heart disease or strokes. Estrogen only replacement therapy may even decrease the risk of heart disease, not stroke, but heart disease. The HRT does not affect the risk of dying from the cardiovascular disease. And again, estrogen replacement therapy in tablet form, not the patches, not the gels, not the creams, that may slightly increase the risk of stroke but the risk of stroke is generally very low in women less than 60, right? So in other words, if you are at a high risk of, well, if you are at a high risk of having cardiovascular disease, it may be possible still for you to safely have hormone replacement therapy. But again, you need to see your doctor because it's dependent upon your individual circumstance and you need to be assessed properly before it is given. Right, so treatment summaries. So like we talked about in the beginning, you know, we can divide the symptom presentation into categories. When you do your diary and we see that you have uh, a focus on the hot flashes and the night sweats and the physical symptoms and psychological symptoms, then we can choose what treatment modalities would be best for you. So this is one way of looking at it. So if you want to control the hot flashes and the night sweats, right? HRT is going to be your best option. Um, and again, well, the when where you where you have tablets and patches and creams and gels and and implants available and a various assortment of tablets as well, you know, you can go crazy with the amount of HRT variation that that you know you can use with your patients and um, you can tweak till that kingdom come but again in Trinidad unfortunately we don't have that luxury um, so this is where we have to rely on all of these supplemental therapies where we can right so things like the paroxetine um, which uh, when it's being used for hot flashes and night sweats it's sold as brisdel right um or you can use effexor venlafaxine right that is actually proven to be um, probably better than the brisdel uh, more effective in preventing the um, hot flashes and night sweats but it's a twice daily dose so compliance is a lot easier to tell a patient to take a tablet at night than to take a tablet twice a day you know but i guess if one fails you can try the other Clonidine is the alpha-2 agonist the blood pressure medication that we were talking about that is not readily available here either. Um, and it works better as a patch than it does as a tablet. Um, of course, again, this is where our focus tends to be in Trinidad. I mean, you know, when we can, we use the hormonal replacement therapy. And certainly I would advocate for the hormonal replacement therapy. Um, but these supplemental therapies are important as well. Vitamin E, 800 units a day, right, has been shown to be effective. The soy, the red clover, right, especially where severe vasomotor symptoms occur, it will work best then because when it's severe, any change actually, you know, feels good. So especially if you could use it in conjunction with other things, you could get any kind of improvement is good improvement. The black cohosh, the St. John's was the chastaberry. Well, chastaberry is is a, a combination herbal product that actually contains black cohosh, St. John's wort, uh, not St. John's wort, but dong quai and and um, American ginseng, and it, it tends to work better. But it also will have because of the combination, it will have significant drug interactions. Um, decreasing your alcohol and caffeine intake and engaging in aerobic and low intensity exercise, the cooling break, bracelets, the acupressure bands, the acupuncture, all supporting therapy. And again, in refractory cases, the stellate ganglion blockade. 
um, right? Psychological symptom control, again, HRT is your first choice. We could use the venlafaxine, the Effexor, and the uh, Brisdel. Um, testosterone injections, the injections are better than the, than the um, creams and, and the implants, um, but the implants are better than the creams and the gels. Um, and of course, the testosterone, testosterone boosting foods that we talked about. Vitamin D3 supplementation, it comes up quite a good bit in almost every aspect since COVID. But there has been a lot of evidence that vitamin D3 actually helps. Um, and it helps by boosting testosterone production. And it helps, and testosterone, of course, helps with mood and muscle strength and fatigue and libido. So you'll see it appearing there quite often. Cognitive behavioral therapy, aerobic exercise, acupuncture, acupressure, all very worthwhile. And again, you see this in John's ward. But again, with the um, note that drug interactions are common. Genital, ur genital urinary syndrome of menopause. Well, so this is basically when you have that vulval soreness. The vulval dryness, so the vagina is sore, the vagina is dry. You have an increased risk of infection because the pH changes. You have, because of that, you may have painful intercourse. Because of the painful intercourse, you don't want to have intercourse, so you have decreased libido. You have related urinary symptoms because when the vajayjay is dry, then the tube that you pass urine through, the urethra becomes dry, and it feels almost like you're like when you pass urine that is burning, so you think you have a bladder infection when it's not, right? Sometimes you may even see blood in the urine because it's so dry and it burns so much. And that just makes you run to the bathroom very often. And it could also be affected by the long-term complication of prolapse, yes? And it could cause incontinence. And of course, all of this could also... Uh, encompass the sexual arousal disorders so when you have dryness down there it impacts in a negative way too in your ability to um, achieve uh, an orgasm right so it's a common and distressing often underdiagnosed underprotected underreported and undertreated disorder the first logical choice for treatment uh, because it's effective and because it's well tolerated and it could be used long term is the vaginal estrogen cream. It does not have any significant impact on breast tissue when you use it down there. So your focus is going to be down there, right? So in other words, if this is your biggest problem in your symptom chart, in your diary, then our focus is going to be giving you local estrogen cream and not tablets. Yes, and because the cream is focused on the VJJ, it gets small amounts get absorbed through the VJJ itself and it does not impact in any negative way on breast tissue or um, womb tissue then what you have is something that you could use long term um, lubricants and moisturizers can be used as supplements as well um, lubricants are literally only for uh, immediate effect so they usually used more so with intercourse um, and they come in water-based oil-based um, versions um, moisturizers tend to have a little bit longer lasting effects you may have to apply more frequent um, you have to apply more frequently than the estrogen but less frequently than the lubricants every two to three days or so um, and they plump up the vaginal tissue by rehydrating it so it has a little bit it has a better effect the lubricants just kind of sit on top the moisturizers um, go in. So the moisturizers are like the replens. Your lubricants are like the KY, right? Um, and of course, these are some of the only options that we have for those patients with breast cancer. Osfina is a oral preparation, hormone-free oral preparation that actually works really well for those patients with breast cancer that have finished their treatment. Um, it is uh, it produces a estrogen like effect but it's not estrogen um, so you want to wait until the breast cancer patient finishes all of their treatment because they actually use some breast cancer patients would use medications similar to this um, 
to help keep the cancer away and you don't want this to interfere with that. So you want them to finish all of their treatment and then you could impl implement this. And this actually has been shown to have some very positive uh, impact. Um, but again, it's not available in Trinidad. Um, the prasterone is the DHEA. Um, and that can be taken as a tablet or it can be taken as a vaginal insert. The actual prasterone is a vaginal insert. Um, it cannot be used long term, though. Um, it's usually licensed for use up to about three months. But th that three month course actually produces effects that last as long as a year. So I guess if you wanted to repeat the course after the year, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. But again, it's not available in Trinidad. Um, with respect to laser therapy, there isn't a lot of um, studies that that show definitive um, success with laser therapy, but um, there are some studies that suggest that it's promising. Um, and they did have it available here in Trinidad, actually, for those who are interested. Musculoskeletal syndrome of menopause. Well, this is where you have the joint pain, the joint stiffness, the back pain, the calf pain, the muscle aches, where patients complain about losing height. They have that stooped posture. They can't walk properly. They walk very slowly because they have poor balance and they be, they develop easily acquired fractures, especially around the hip, spine, and wrist. And that happens in more than 70% of women. Well, not the symptoms happen in more than 70% of women, not the fractures per se. 25% of those 70% will be disabled by, by those symptoms during the actual menopausal transition. And 40% of the women, actually, when they present to the doctor and the doctor examines them, they can't find anything. Even if they image, they don't really find anything structurally wrong, right? So when we're treating these patients, basically, we keep in mind that women over 65 should be screened for osteoporosis or brittle bones. Um, if you are between 50 and 64 and have certain risk factors, so if you have a family history of osteoporosis, if you have a small stature, if you're vegetarian, if you smoke, if you've been on steroids um, for whatever reason during the course of your life, especially long term, if you've had some sort of cancer risk, um, then you too should be screened. Um, and an effort should be made to increase your protein intake as part of your, um, your lifestyle changes. Vitamin D3, like I said, it comes up routinely. You should be taking that daily, and you should take that in combination with magnesium. Um, vitamin D3, magnesium, calcium, all are linked together. Um, and there is evidence that it actually helps in the treatment of osteoporosis. Whether it helps in prevention is something that still is still left to be seen, especially in the perimenopausal phase. Vitamin K2 is also shown to be helpful in treatment. And of course, the Probably the best known um, or best prescribed treatment would be exercise, right? Um, it's the only thing that most of us agree on, really and truly. Um, and it is the most effective form is the resistance training, where you use the heavier weights, like a kettlebell, um, and you do it in lower repetition sets. So that helps to build muscle strength, and then the muscle strength in turn helps to strengthen the bone. The risk of breaking a bone because of osteoporosis, because of brittle bone disease during that menopausal transition, during the, men during the perimenopausal period is low, right? But the HRT reduces that low risk even further. And that protection will only last though while you are taking it. But if you take it for a longer period of time, you are more likely to have a longer lasting effect even when you stop it. So that is why if we're using it for prevention of osteoporosis, you have it in your head that you're on it for at least a five-year period. Right? <laughs> Just to break the monotony here. Right? Follow-up. Well, um, once you've decided that you're starting HRT, once we've spoken to you about your dietary supplement, about all of the other supplementary, supplementary um, therapies, right, because everything should be used together, right, more or less, um, then uh, we will need to see you back. So the best option would be for you to come back with your diary, right, in three months' time, right, um, three months after you start your HRT. 
where we get to review and make sure that things are heading in a positive direction. And if they are heading in a positive direction, then we would probably see you again three months after that. And then again, once we're continuing in that positive direction, then you could be seen annually, right? Um, but you, you should make sure that you report anything that may be amiss for you in any one of those review appointments. Um, unscheduled bleeding, meaning that you can have bleeding that is, so if I give you the, um, the Angelique, like we talked about, if you're an Angelique, you're postmenopausal. Um, if you're an Angelique, you shouldn't have a bleed. Uh, but I might have given you the Angelique when you your last period was 11 months ago in anticipation that you wouldn't have a period in the 12th month um, and thereby making you postmenopausal. But then you come back and you say, Doc, I'm bleeding. So it is not uncommon that you can have some spotting when you don't expect the spotting or even a, something akin to an actual period when you in that three month period because that's the adjustment period so we allow that um, especially if you've had an assessment um, before initiating the hrt however if it continues beyond the three months you need to promptly report that so that is something that we need to know because you, we need to be investigated along a different line and of course if you're not getting any kind of improvement with the with the, med with the hormone replacement therapy or any of the other therapies, um, whether it's by themselves or in combination with the HRT, then you should tell us that as well. Um, hopefully your diaries will reflect that. And if you have any intolerable side effects, we need to know that as well, right? Um, and again, emphasizing that, you know, routine screening assessments should continue as normal during this whole process. How do you stop HRT? Well, there isn't any real, well, there isn't a best way to do this, perhaps. Um, so you can stop either abruptly, you can just stop immediately, or you can try reducing the dose gradually. If you have, uh, if you want to stop suddenly, then you're more likely to have a rebound effect. Although that effect, a rebound effect of, of especially the vasomotor symptoms, but you may have a rebound effect of others as well but they tend to be less intense than they would have been when you first started the HRT. Um, if it is you stop it gradually, you're less likely to have those symptoms return, but they will ultimately return eventually, right? But um, to a point where you can tolerate it a lot better. So diagnosing and managing premature menopause. Well, premature menopause would be suspected, like I said, if you're menopausal, if you have menopausal symptoms or you have in, infrequent periods or no periods at all and you're younger than 40. The doctor will need to know your personal medical and family history because that may suggest a reason for the early development of menopause and then investigations will stem from that. Confirmation of, your, of the diagnosis, this is when you want to do your FSH. This is when you want to do your blood tests. Right, so you need to do two of them because one is not diagnostic. You need to do one test now and then another test four to six weeks later, right? And that's simply because your this is a hormone uh, 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 like others that would actually fluctuate during your course of your menstrual cycle. You're now a regular menstrual cycle, and if there's any doubt, then you know your GP might want to refer to your gynecologist or menopause specialist. Um, and there is there is at least one self-proclaimed one in Trinidad, um, and there is a, or it might want to, to consider a reproductive medicine um, physician. Treatment is usually hormone replacement therapy or um, the pill, the birth control pill, right? Or some version of uh, hormone of combined hormonal contraception. Um, of course, unless there's any contraindications to it. It would be important to note that if you are if you have premature menopause, if we're starting this medication on you, 
The idea is to continue it until you eat, until you reach that natural age of menopause. So you don't have to worry about the five-year mark, um, about breast cancer risk. You don't have to worry about um, about osteoporosis. Um, well, not osteoporosis. You don't have to worry about the breast cancer risk. And you don't have to worry about stroke and heart disease, right? Unless you stop it prematurely, right? Um, the idea is to to continue that until you reach that magic age of 52, 53, um, so that you have the same level of bone protection that everybody else has, and then you can revise and decide whether you want to continue it beyond that point, right? Uh, the risk of conditions like breast cancer, like we mentioned, and cardiovascular disease increase with age, but it's very low in women, less than 40. Both hormone replacement therapy and combined hormonal contraceptives are good for bone health, which is why they're the two options that we use. But HRT would be better for blood pressure. So if you have an element of blood pressure um, during your assessment, or you're known to have an element of blood pressure, um, then you should probably opt for HRT rather than the combined hormone, hormonal contraceptive. And of course, HRT is not a contraceptive. The chances of you becoming pregnant with the diagnosis of premature menopause, of course, is zero. But if the diagnosis is not what we think it is, <laughs> right, you have to make sure that you use additional protection. Um, if hormonal treatments are not suitable, then alternative treatments, as discussed previously, should be entertained in very much the same way as with the standard menopausal patient. You may need a referral to other specialists along the way to assist with different aspects of your condition. So in other words, this is not a simple, straightforward gynecological issue when your premature menopause um, reasons for it outside of surgery um, can have significant impact on your general health and well-being. So addressing the no period is one thing, but you have to deal with the underlying condition that caused this problem in the first place. And I thought this was a lovely quote from Drew Barrymore. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't bore you all to death. Thank you, Dr. Ishmael, for that very informative and certainly given us a lot, of, lot to think about, um, you know, a lot about the treatments and so on. Um, now we would open the, um, put the question, you know, question and Q&A set part of the um, evening. Um, if anyone has a question, you can simply unmute and, um, you know, you can put your question to Dr. Ishmael. Hello, good evening. PCOS and menopause. My bad. Yeah, so make it a little bit less broad. Tell me what specifically you mean. Um, does PCOS make you more vulnerable to menopause? Okay. Yeah, are, they, are the symptoms more erratic? Uh, uh, what, oh. what are you seeing with persons yes. who have had PCOS from, say, age 20? Yes. Well, PCOS is, uh, is believed to be a genetic condition. So the truth is that it may manifest itself in your 20s, but it is something that you are ultimately born with. The gene that causes it is there from birth. But it's only going to manifest when your periods come to light. And when during the teenage years, periods are very difficult to discern because you're now starting off. So it's always going to be a little bit tricky to make that diagnosis, which is why 20s is when most people get their diagnosis. Does that impact? Well, it all depends. The reality is that no, specifically, it doesn't. Not really. Um, what is different with the polycystic patient is the fact that if they do not control themselves, if they do not regulate through diet, through exercise, and sometimes through use of medication, 
right, they will find themselves having more erratic bleeding, right? And that erratic bleeding can happen at any age. It is magnified with menopause. So their menopausal status will weigh on their polycystic status in combination and potentially, you know, make them bleed more, right? And of course, if they are, if we're going to assume that a polycystic patient is um, uncontrolled, then you can probably visualize them being of, uh, you know, more heavier set, right? And of course, that impacts on menopause as well. So, <laughs> yes, all of that too, right? So, um, but not all polycystic patients would have the, the, um, facial hair story, yes, because it gets quite complex. The polycystic ovarian syndrome, you can have the Victoria's Secret's runway model walking down the red carpet and she's polycystic ovarian syndrome, you know, or you can have the bearded lady in the circus, right? And she's polycystic ovarian syndrome. It could be that diverse as well, right? So they don't have to have the facial hair, right? Um, and the acne, they could just simply have menstrual disturbance, yeah? But um, is there a direct link? Not so much. It's more of what the polycystic ovarian syndrome may do, how you treat it or don't treat it as the case may be, that may impact on menopause and your menopause as a polycystic patient. Is that helpful? I have, I have clients who are, well, aging. They're not, they're uh -huh. not 30s anymore. They're a little mm -hmm. bit further along. Mm -hmm. and, but the hair loss has been significant mm. for a long time mm -hmm. but the weight gain and the superfluous hair is mm. becoming a little bit more mm. erratic so i was hoping as they get older i would see mm. decrease in oh no it increases but you're you're saying that's that's yes. not something i could look no. forward to no so we're going to we're gonna lose <laughs> this and this is increasing <laughs> with the weight <laughs> Well, it, 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 it doesn't have to be like that for everybody, but um, if we start early enough, so the message there is that, you know, you know, if it is that you um, have the family history of menopause at 52, so mommy went through menopause at 52, my aunts went through menopause at 52, so chances are I'm going to end up going through menopause at 52. Mommy is heavy set, my aunts are heavy set. So I know what I have to do to minimize my issues because now they had um, osteoporosis, they have the arthritic pains, um, they are having cardiac issues, they even have the diabetes. All of those things could be preventable. And now that I have that history to draw upon, I know what I need to do by simply changing my lifestyle and potentially going to my my. Uh, my my gp or my my gynecologist at 50 and going here where's the where's the metaphor where's the hrt give me the hrt give it give it listen let's not play <laughs> right are you seeing are you seeing a lot of anxiety with the forty five year old female now as compared to maybe when you had just come home with respect to menopause with respect to menopause i think I think probably within the last year, more so, uh, I think um, aware, you know how we focus on cable and what's going on in the States and what's going on in Europe. And it is a big deal now for people out there to be talking openly about their menopausal symptoms and about going through the menopause and what difficulties they had, whether it was psychological, physical, whether it was just the hot flashes and night sweats. Um, so because they're talking about it and we're hearing it, we're feeling a lot better and easier to bring it up. So they are asking more questions um, than they certainly used to. Um, and that is one of the reasons why, you know, not just when I came home, but when I was training way back when, um, hormone replacement therapy was just not something that, that was on the market. And it wasn't on the market because they didn't have a demand for it, right? They just didn't have a demand for it. Um, distributors would bring it in and it wouldn't sell, right? Um, now, people are asking why it's not here, how can I get, you know, what process do I have to walk through to get this particular one? Um, and even in the UK, they, they're making, um, they, they're trying very desperately to try and get a lot of these hormone replacement therapies, the simpler ones like the vaginal creams, 
off of off of a prescription list. So in Scandinavia now, you can walk into a pharmacy and get a vaginal estrogen cream, you know, which is yay, good, wonderful, right? Um, and in some of the islands, uh, the Caribbean islands, you can get a hell of a lot more um, hormone replacement options than you could get here in Trinidad. But yes, in the last a short answer, yes, in the last year, more so than in the last decade, um, the last five years, within the last year or so, there have been more people asking questions. Because we, we have big curry, we talk about it all the time in the salon. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, my salon will be 40 years, <coughs> oh, wow. 40 years old in January. Mm -hmm. So we've gone through the seasons. We, myself included, have gone through the changes. It speaks to the hair every time there's a, a change mm -hmm. in the body chemistry. Mm -hmm. It becomes visible mm -hmm. <clears throat> for me. So, but you know, ten years ago you couldn't use the word menopause in the salon. Yeah, right? yeah, everybody yeah. was like, yeah, like it, it was a the, crime. So now we celebrate yeah. birthdays. Yeah, it's easier. Yeah. It's easier psychologically to talk about yes. your birthday and what are the plans. Yeah. So it tells me I need to I need to adjust mm -hmm. my vocabulary so that I can adjust. Yes. Yeah and walk through the process yes. and we just have open dialogue you know yeah i've tried to have zoom sessions with and coffee mornings with yeah persons who qualified like yourself to have the discussions because you know it's like yeah but now that there's a lot more dialogue but i'm also seeing mm -hmm. a lot more pcos i'm seeing a lot of the yes. hair loss with younger yes. people um, uh, but I was chatting to a doctor, yeah. she was saying the odds have, it's gone from one in 10 to one in five to one in three. Yeah, I think, you see, because uh, with, re with respect to the polycystic ovarian syndrome thing again, I mean, you know, medicine is a very dynamic field and the more we learn is, you know, the more we learn. And ultimately with polycystic ovarian syndrome, we really did think 50 years ago that it was the bearded lady in the circus. Right. And because there's been so much research, I mean, you can find books the size of Bibles that talk nothing of other than polycystic ovarian syndrome. And we know so much more now that we know that it's also that runway model that we talked about before. So their pathophysiology, their disease process, though, is very different from menopause. Menopause is a normal physiological thing. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is not necessarily pathological in the true sense. It's not something okay. that is necessarily going to kill you, right? It's, it's a condition that you have, that you have to learn to live with because it makes you more vulnerable. That's ultimately what it means, right? Um, but it, you can work your way around it, right? The thinning hair story with the patient with polycystic ovarian syndrome is, is definitively a hormonal thing. But obviously, like everybody else, it could be compounded by stress. The menopausal patient, it is because of a hormonal thing, but a different hormonal thing. So one is increased testosterone, the other one is more likely to be decreased estrogen. Yes. And again, with 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 a patient who has or who you think may be menopausal because they are 49 and they're having hair loss, right? You don't just naturally assume that it's menopause because there are overlapping symptoms. There's so many symptoms with menopause that you can't just assume that. So vitamin D deficiency, for example, very common here in the tropics, very common in Trinidad. You would not believe Trinidadians don't like the sun, right? You tell them to go exercise and they tell you, okay, I wait until three o'clock because it's not too hot, right? And they put it on the biggest, broadest hat to go. Right, so they're not getting that sun exposure, and COVID just made that worse. You have vitamin deficiency, vitamin D deficiency. You're going to get thinning hair. Your hair is going to drop. Your nails are going to get brittle. Your bones are going to ache. In fact, again, you're going to get calf pain, and you're going to get swelling in your ankles. And then you go, oh my God, I'm menopausal, right? And those are your only symptoms. And this is what the symptom diary is good for. You're 45, you're experiencing this because you have a high stress job and you're in a, you go to work in dark, you come home in dark, right? You have no time to exercise, you're not eating properly. So you come to the, the gynecologist and you say, I'm menopausal dread, <laughs> right? 
if you don't sit down to reflect on that symptom diary or to ask the right questions, you start giving them an, um, hormone replacement therapy when they may not necessarily need it, and you miss the diagnosis completely, and the symptom the, the symptoms continue, and the HRT doesn't doesn't work. You, you know what I mean? I mean that's a drastic example, but that's what I'm talking about in this whole consultation process. You you should not sit down at home and make the assumption that okay my hair is getting thin, you know this is happening. I'm 45. Okay, right? So this must be it. You should always try to get an assessment done. You know that gives you an a an holistic overview yes, of exactly of where exactly. you're at at the point in of time. Where you're at exactly. Okay, so I I know what next january the direction i could head in with my clients very good because everybody's changing season so Damn. thank you very much you're most welcome it's not encouraging to think that people who have had pcos for however long going to not have something better to look forward to right but okay well, they might consider it better you know Cons i mean depending on, on on their circumstance they might be very happy to not see their period again and that alone might give them satisfaction. <laughs> that alone might tell them, yay. <laughs> they might jump for joy. You know? Thanks a lot, Sally. You're Hope. welcome. Dr. Shmuel, can I ask um, do you is is there a time period that you recommend that um, a time limit for you, for having HRT? You know, would you say you should well, stop after up, up five years or what, what would you recommend? Well, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, usually if a patient comes to me and um, because, again, in Trinidad, um, we just have the one oral preparation of hormone replacement therapy and we have um, a cream, a vaginal estrogen cream. Um, everything else is not is not um, on formulary so it's not being sold I don't want to say legally but it's, it's not being sold in the appropriate way um, and access will therefore not necessarily be consistent so a patient who is who comes to me who gets HRT is going to be a person who is already postmenopausal right um and she gets angelique let's say and if it is it's going to depend the duration is going to depend on what she tells me in that symptom diary or what she tells me in the history so if it is that i look at her symptom diary and she's got all of her ticks going on the side with the with the hot flashes the night sweats the mood swings the insomnia the irritability right then I'm going to go, okay, so yeah, you, you've, got, you've got your acute symptoms, right? So if it's acute, meaning that it's happening now, it's, it should only last because acute symptoms generally last for less than a year. Sometimes they can go longer. So sometimes they are those odd women that will continue for all 14, 15 years, right? But the frequency obviously diminishes with time. You become more tolerable of it with time. So if you come for that reason, and I validate that reason from your diary, then I consider at least a year to start with the potential for stopping at two once you're getting relief. Um, that may change because some patients will come and say, well, now, nah, dog, I'm I happy, you know, I'm glad. Um, let me continue it now. But then you have to make sure that you come back every year as boring as it may be to do the same usual stuff, to take a look, to take a feel, to make sure that all is well, um, and therefore it's okay for you to continue, right? And central to all of that will be doing your mammogram and your breast ultrasound, right? If it is that you come to me and you say, well, I'm 45, I'm postmenopausal, so I got it kind of early, it's not technically premature menopause, I am of Asian descent. I am a vegetarian. I had bad asthma when I was a child and I was on steroids in hospital all the time, right? I don't get to do very much exercise doc because I have a high stress job, right? Um, and my mother 
um, broke her hip when she was 85 and died as a result. I would look at you and say, aha, uh -huh, so you are an HRT from now to like kingdom come, right? Because you are the person who is going to be at high risk of osteoporosis. And you cannot do very much with HRT to prevent osteoporosis in less than five years. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. And could you, um, I just wanted, could you just um, tell us a little bit about the importance of the testosterone? Because I think, you know, we, we all know about estrogen and progesterone, mm -hmm. but testosterone is not something. Um, do you yeah. recommend, do you recommend supplements or how do, what do you, can you well, tell us a bit about I mean, that? Yeah, again, testosterone, the best way to take testosterone is through injection. For a woman, it's, it's, it's best to take it as an injection. And I know I don't have access to testosterone injections in my practice because I just don't. I mean, to, to access that, you have to have access through an American formulary. Um, and I am not uh, registered in the U.S. to practice, so I can't write a prescription for it because these things are prescription medications as well, right? Um, you might be able to access it through the Caribbean islands. Um, so, and yes, some of the Caribbean islands will accept our prescriptions but i mean transport can cause you know shipment could cause issues so it's it's a complicated matter to get access to it if you're going to do it through a suitcase trade kind of thing um why use testosterone well, testosterone is quite important um it is important to alleviate symptoms some of the, a lot of the physical and even some of the psychological symptoms of hrt so um, the psychological symptoms like the, the low mood, um, the fatigue, um, anxiety, all can be alleviated with the aid of testosterone. It wouldn't be my first choice, so you'll still end up getting hormone replacement therapy in the form of a, of a pill, a patch, a gel, or something to that effect. Um, but where that doesn't alleviate the symptoms, so you get a little bit of relief, but you're not getting, you're, not, you're still feeling kind of ugh, right? testosterone becomes a good option as an injection, right? Um, in, the pellets are also um, a good option, but pellets are, um, again, not easily accessible. And the Caribbean people, you know, it's a it's an implant that you have to actually insert. So, you know, we're not always terribly good with those things. You know, you tell somebody that in your practice and they kind of look at you and go, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? So you might get away with the injection over the pellet but yes those are important and of course you know the principal reason why most people look at it and focus on it is because of the decreased libido right so um but it is important in all different other aspects too so you have muscle mass um fatigue and mood are uh, other reasons other indications for using it where that you know again because because we don't have access, you learn to adapt, right? So you can get, if, you, if these symptoms, if you look at your diary again, and you see that these symptoms are present, but they're not, they're present, but they're not in the forefront, you know? Um, you can advise the patient to alter their diet, to include a lot of those testosterone-boosting foods that we had listed in the um, in the presentation, right? A handful of almonds on a daily basis, oily fish like salmon and, and um, mackerel, right? Little things like that, including it in your diet, peas and beans, um, red kidney beans and, and um, pinto beans and that kind of stuff, just protein intake, right? The, the supplements in that help to boost testosterone production. Thank you very that, much, Dr. Yes, sorry? Mm. That, that's very much. That's very helpful. Um, are there um, any more questions? You can simply unmute and ask your question. Mm. 
No. Okay. Well. Um, so, yes, I have a question. What do we want to hear? Hello. Hi. How much rest does the mm. menopausal woman need? I know that's there's no one fixed answer, but mm -hmm. I'm sure we're, we're in such a fast world today, and mm. we want to keep up with this and keep up with the other. Mm. I. Mm -hmm. I am of the view, tell mm -hmm. me if I'm right or wrong, mm -hmm. um, whether we are getting enough rest in our lives to mm. deal with the problems. Mm -hmm. No, that's a very good point. Um, it's part and parcel of that whole lifestyle measure thing that we kind of breezed through in the presentation. Um, we refer to it as sleep hygiene. Um, so what you need, and that's one of the reasons why two menopausal women get, get into a, a you know, they start going down a rabbit hole is because they get those hot flashes at night. They can't sleep. So it disturbs your whole sleep pattern. You wake up the next morning very irritable, right? And then, you know, you're grouchy all day. And because you're grouchy all day and the pattern repeating itself the next day, it just continues and goes on and on. And it can precipitate a low mood scenario. Right, so you are quite right. Central to that, or compounding compounding that, is the stress of day to day life. So, the perimenopausal woman in today's society is going to be in a high power job. You know, eight to four, coming home, making um, lunch for her children, or going to the gym. Right, um, so running from one point to next. Yes, that in itself, that stress impacts in a very negative way on your ability to cope during the perimenopause. And being able to get sleep is not specific to menopause, but obviously, yes, it does weak. If you don't get enough sleep, it's going to be bad, right? So generally speaking, you know, you need to have at least six hours of undisturbed sleep. Undisturbed sleep, right? And that's not the menopausal woman. That's just pretty much anybody. Yes? And, you know, anybody in adulthood. Yes? But the undisturbed is important too, right? The undisturbed is important because you might think you're sleeping, but any little noise waken you up, right? So you have to, what you have to try and do in that perimenopausal period or that menopausal period is you try to make your environments as sleep friendly as possible. So because you're worried about the night sweats, you keep your clothing light, right? Um, cotton, if anything, you keep your bedroom well ventilated. Yes, you avoid stimulation technical stimulation so you see the tv in the bedroom kind of story and you radio that play and all kind of funky music and you're trying to sleep no those are not things that are going to help yes so you try to reduce that as much as possible you'll have to treat symptoms so again the night sweats you have to treat you because you can't even with all of that you can't get undisturbed sleep if you're waking up drenched in sweat you can't get enough sleep if your bladder is so irritated because it's so dry that it wakes you up from sleep to go pee, right? So another thing that you do is you don't aggravate your bladder by drinking the coffee and the tea before bed. Hell, don't even drink. They're not going to help your bladder. So you're going to end up getting more disturbed sleep, right? If you end up doing those things or, you know, engaging in those things. So to answer your question, about six hours on average, undisturbed sleep. 
and you have to stress reduce regard by sir. <laughs> so meditating before bed is a good thing too. Say your prayers. <laughs> Uh, do we we have time for one more question? Does um does anyone have a, an, another question to ask Dr. Ishmael before we wrap up here? Okay. Well, I I think we you know I I, I think um I think we've um. Dr. Shmoney covered quite a lot, so um, I'll hand over to our president, um, Rowena Watley, who wanted to, to give the vote of thanks. Right, I was unmuting. Well, when it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. And tonight, Dr. Sally and Ishmael, we are extremely happy and we are very grateful that you took your time and you delivered in a very gentle, mild-mannered way our topic, All Things Menopause. Thank you for inspiring us to be confident in this phase of our lives and to accept that there is guidance and advice to help us through it. We now know how to recognize acute to mild symptoms, and you've given us strategies and tools to deal with this and to ensure that we don't take our lives for granted, but that we will be forever grateful that people like you are around. Thank you. And for all our attendees this evening, on behalf of SI Esperance, thank you for participating in our little session in recognition of World Menopause Day 2024. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, especially Dr. Ishmael. Good night, night. Good night, and thank you. And there's some nice little, um, I noticed that people are saying thank you on the chat might be a good idea for us to open up the chat and see it. Very nice chats. Um, Randy Mohammed, I would like to sincerely yeah. thank Dr. Ishmael. Danny, thanks for the clarity of this roller coaster of a ride through this journey of menopause. So it's very well appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.